Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so delighted to have you with us. We hope you've had opportunity to watch us before. A Look Ahead is a presentation of the Sabbath School lessons as presented by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we're doing a series on witnessing and evangelism. And this is lesson number two in this series for April 14 of 2012. It's entitled, Every Member Ministry. And we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us now as we begin. Our loving Father, we know that it has been a long time that you've waited for us. We know that the church seems sometimes to be asleep. You prophesied that that would be the case. Help us to know how we can wake up, how we can witness to others, how we can bring the gospel to the whole world so that the end may come soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In our first lesson in this series, we noted that um, the focus on evangelism, personal witnessing, was going to be our theme for this quarter. Who is supposed to do the witnessing in the church, in our church? Is it the pastor who's paid to do the witnessing? Or is it possible that every church member, including you and me, are supposed to be involved in one way or another? Let me put it in a very blunt kind of way. If God sent an inspection team to check out our Sabbath school, our Sabbath school class, or our church, to see how well we were witnessing, what grade would we get? You want an answer? What would be the criteria for that grade? Should, well, it, is, should I see Ken Hart on the on the corner the, somewhere preaching the, and, the, and the, telling the purpose, everybody, yelling, yeah. yelling and screaming that the Lord is going to come to all the people walking by? And but the perfect score would be when we arrive at the Verde Gates. That, that would, would be, be the, the witness. That would be the perfect score on the witnessing. Yes. Perfect score in the witnessing. Okay. Well, in a Sabbath school class, aren't we just witnessing to each other? I mean, well, you really, a Sabbath school class doesn't seem to be a witnessing opportunity unless you actually invite a guest. That's also true. However, the Sabbath school class is the place where Adventists and Christians in general should be interacting to plan for what the church is going to be doing. So the Sabbath school class, I would think, would be an ideal place to be at least talking about how we're going to witness. Why not try, try to witness like Jesus did to some extent? Because he yeah. came here to teach us about the Father. Mm -hmm. That was his job as a teacher. He's called a teacher and, yeah. and a, a rabbi. rabbi and all that. Mm -hmm. So uh, you've got to line up what's important. Mm -hmm. so, That's what I was thinking, too, that we have the Gospels telling us how Jesus dealt with people of his time, and maybe we should be the same, doing the same. Well, one of the issues is, what, what is a personal witness? Well, now, we, we, we have public gatherings from time to time, and they're organized, and they have some fancy speaker gets up and makes a presentation. That's public evangelism. What about a personal kind of witness? I, I think there are two types. Okay. There's the message that you preach by the life you live, by the interaction that you have with, with those with whom you come in contact, your business associates. Do they, uh, do they know that you have a, a, a higher calling, that you are interested in something else? And then there's the words you say at, uh, at some meeting or with one-to-one -one as a mm -hmm. as an instructor of, of Bible mm -hmm. and I, I think that uh, if we really were top-notch at the first one second one would probably come along pretty automatic mm -hmm. well one of the things that's proved effective <coughs> down through the generations in terms of convincing people about the effects of the gospel is a personal witness 
And generally, that cons the con consists of something like this. Um, people talk about what their life was like before they became a Christian. Then they usually tell about what happened that led them up to becoming a Christian. And then they talk about how their life was different after they were Christians. That's a personal witness. Now, you know, some of us have been Adventists all our lives. We grew up in Adventist families. But there were times in our lives when things happened which pushed us in one way or another um, in terms of our Christianity. And those things could, could be an opportunity for witness. Well, you but, know, I live in a community that isn't Adventist. Mm -hmm. In fact, they don't even know what a Seventh-day Adventist is. And I think a personal witness is to have a ready answer when they ask, why are you different? Mm -hmm. What, what, I'm, mm -hmm. uh, they notice, I don't notice anything strange about me, but they seem to notice <laughs> something strange and you get questions. And so it's to have a ready answer because well, it's not the norm in the world. Yeah. How what? many hours of conversation should you have with an outsider before the name of Jesus or God is, is mentioned? Fair question. One, one of the advantages of a personal witness is it's pretty, for, pretty hard for anybody to argue with you about your story. They might argue if you start saying, well, we should believe this, or we should do this, or the Bible teaches this, that. They can argue about all those things. But if you give a personal witness, it's pretty hard for them to argue about your personal witness. Now, that has its pluses and its minuses. You might say your personal story might not be very convincing. That's the other side of the... Well, the question that I'd like to ask is how does all this start? You go out and, and stop somebody and say, hey, I want to tell you what, I want to witness to you. I want to tell you about Jesus. And the guy yeah. will say, uh, maybe tomorrow I'm leaving, you know, and, <laughs> and something like that. So, so how does it start? I think when you take the advice of Ellen White and split up and don't always live in one place where you all know each other, it's absolutely phenomenal how people will ask you questions just by things you're doing that you don't even realize that they catch is religious or something because you get questions all the time. And I know I had a man say to me, and I was going to say, I said, well, I'll give you this book. He says, I don't want any book. He says, I just want to talk to you and ask you questions. He says, I don't want to read any book. Hmm. So you what know. does that have to do with splitting up? Well, when, when you're living in Loma Linda, you don't run into anybody that asks you questions. Everybody right. already knows everything. Right now, most of the population is not Adventist anymore. It's not a big Adventist ghetto like mm -hmm. it used to be. It's, there's tons of other people now. Really? Yeah, a lot of other people so realize that something like that. A lot of other people realize it's a nice place to live. Mm -hmm. so. And why is it? Well... There's less crime in general. Uh, other things like that that, that people like. It must be something that somebody's witnessing. Yeah. Well, if you do not feel you have a personal witness, would it be correct to say you need a closer relationship with God? In our postmodern society, with a culture that is saturated with sound bites and television and other forms of media, is it even possible to witness in any way like the apostles did? What do you think? As we come down to the final moments of this earth's history, how are we supposed to be witnessing? Well, you know, the apostles witnessed because they knew Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I think our personal witness is studying the Bible and understanding the Bible stories in, accurate, in an accurate way and understanding Jesus and how he was prophesied. And that gives us a witness like the apostles. We have to know about Jesus. We can't just forget the Bible and then say, we've had some emotional, personal experience with Jesus, yeah. and therefore, but I think the apostles knew Jesus solidly, his words, and if we know him solidly, that's more of a personal witness. It shows that we've personally studied the life. If the second coming of Jesus were dependent upon your witness, how long would it take? Past my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, how could you rectify that? Uh, are you insinuating that um, we're not doing it enough? Well, I'm just, 
We're going to look at some verses. So <laughs> I'm just trying to find out where you're coming from yeah. with these questions. It's taking it personal rather than saying, well, somebody else will do that. Yeah. I don't have to be responsible for that. You see, here, here's the problem. We have, I mean, Ellen White has made it very clear that there's three things that consistently make a, a Christian life grow. It's Bible study, prayer, and witnessing. Now, Bible study and prayer may be lacking. We may not be doing an excellent job, but it's a little hard for anyone to say, well, you're not studying your Bible enough, someone else to say that to you. But if the church is not growing, it's not too hard to say somebody's not witnessing. Well, I, I wonder about the word witnessing. Aren't you just saying talking about it? I mean, what's what's with the the word witness? I mean, I'm witnessing to you. Yeah. I'm witnessing to her. Yes. I'm witnessing wit witnessing to the people watching on TV. Yeah. So all that's happening, mm -hmm. but but you're implying that witnessing is always for somebody that doesn't know anything about God. Well, let's let's no, no, I wasn't implying that. But let's look at what the verses say. Ephesians four verse twelve says, it's talking about Jesus. He did this to prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service in order to build up the body of Christ. That's supposed to be the goal. Well, you know, sometimes I always pray God witness through me because I can feel like the dumbest thing on two feet and to make all sorts of errors. And I'm going, if I hold myself up as a witness, I'm going to land in a mud puddle. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So it, I think God has to witness through us with yeah. his power because left on our own device, we will embarrass him. You well, don't think? Yeah, it's very possible. Oh, I, and I, I would agree. That's my it, level let, of Let me give you some more words. This is 2 Corinthians 5, starting with verse 15. He died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves. How many of us are doing that? but only for him who died and was raised to life for their sake. No longer then do we judge anyone by human standards, even at, if at one time we judged Christ according to human standards. We no longer do so. Anyone who is joined to Christ is a new being. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is done by God, who through Christ changed us from enemies into his friends and gave us a task of making others his friends also. So he changes us, and then he says, okay, I did it for you. You help me do it for somebody else. Our message is, this is Paul writing, our message is that God was making the whole human race his friends through Christ. God did not keep an account of their sins, and he has given us a message which tells how he makes them his friends. Here we are then, speaking for Christ, as though God himself were making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, let God change you from enemies into his friends. So how would we respond to those words? So where does the witnessing come in there? I mean, there's a lot of things here you talked about there. Yeah. So Wit witnessing is God has made us his friends. We're supposed to help make others his friends also. So what is the witness? Well... Just, I mean, that's just something the we'll, fact that I'm, I am his friend now, is I'm witnessing to that fact? Is that that's, what you're talking about? That's part of it. it obviously, as Norm has already suggested, uh, we're talking about the way people live. We're supposed to be a witness in all the ways from, you know, don't, don't hide your light under a bushel. Uh, the Jesus said in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, put, put it up on a hill, let everybody see it, the whole countryside around. What does that mean? I think that we have missed the uh, benefit of thanksgiving. Uh, if we were to acknowledge the multiple times a day mm -hmm. that God has blessed us, provided something that we are using, if we were to give him credit and say, I'm so thankful that God has left this thing here for me and, and now we can use it. And, and you have you have directed somebody's mind to God, at least for a moment. Mm -hmm. And if they're curious, they can ask another question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the role of thanksgiving uh, has been, hasn't been 
utilized sufficiently, much, much of the time, because we just go on a, oblivious and account things to luck and to good fortune and to 101 other things, the blessings that God has provided Are for us. Are you talking us. about personal Thanksgiving yes. or public? Yeah. yeah, personal. Public no, thing. personal. As you're, as, you're in, as you're having a conversation with somebody, just include the thanksgiving in the conversation and move on. I can mm -hmm. see how public thanksgiving could be a witness, but personal... Well, let me give you an example. I work at a clinic taking care of poor people, mm -hmm. and many of them are Hispanic. And they don't hesitate, especially the older ones. They don't hesitate a bit. You come in and say, guess what? Your blood work is better than it was three months ago. And their immediate response is, Praise gracias a Dios. Mm -hmm. you know, thank the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and it's well, not just a saying. Mm -hmm. No, it's not just a saying. Well, are people that are of that level that you're communicating about uh, more receptive than people who are well off financially? I can't, he's seen me in human nature, if you're well off financially and your health is good, what do you need to change? Mm -hmm. Unless there's something else in, in your life that is um, causing this search, I think it's just uh, well, every seed one, on mm -hmm. rocks. Every one of us is called to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. That's right. Do we represent him correctly? Now that's a different question. Yes. Do you consider yourself to be an ambassador for him? If we're misrepresenting him, we're on the, in the same area as Satan was, misrepresenting God, and Moses was when he struck the rock the second time. That's pretty... I once had the privilege of, of studying for a short time in a public university, a large public university. Went to a, a Saturday night gathering of students, and one of the people, one of the students there just turned to me Apparently because of, I never did know why, apparently because of something I'd said in class or something, and said, do you consider yourself to be a missionary? Bang. I mean, you know, where do you go from there? Well, we spent the whole rest of the evening talking about God and, and what it means to be a Christian and the implications of all kinds of things. We have such good news that we've been uh, fortunate yeah. to be exposed to the great controversy view. And it, it's, it, to me, it's invigorating to be able to, Try to, and an attempt to try to pique somebody's interest. Mm -hmm. Now, the Holy Spirit is not dead. No. It isn't your syllables that you're running together that's going to make a change in their life. But it uh, plants their lip. Maybe they've been looking for something different, and maybe you have an opportunity. Yeah. I have a planter in, on, in the front of my yard, and there's a sidewalk where people always walk and jog and that sort of thing. And so I found at a, a home store, I found a statue of an angel praying. And I put it in the middle of the planter. And I said, God, please make this planter, the flowers beautiful, inspirational. So as people go by, mm -hmm. they think of you and creation. And um, the planter has beautiful flowers. So I think, you know, <laughs> another asking God to mm -hmm. witness to himself, I think. Somehow, our hobbies, the things that we have vital interest in, that we work mm -hmm. on, we have no problem talking about that with somebody. Mm -hmm. We can promote that. We can be exuberant about it. If we had the kind of connection with Christ that was as close as we have with our hobbies, mm -hmm. wouldn't it be just as natural then to talk about about Christ? Yeah. How, about, how about people that talk about their favorite person, which is themselves? Mm -hmm. They do a, a bang-up job. I mean, they can bend people's ear all, all evening. But to talk about God, I mean, I think we got some... Do, do, you, think, yeah. do you think God is counting on us to uh, do something for Him? Yes and no. He doesn't need us, but He gives us the privilege. Okay. What do we mean when we say ministry? Is that a job for the paid pastoral staff? Anything that has to do with the last of the six commandments. <laughs> the, or are all church members supposed to be involved in one type of ministry or another? Just the way you treat the people you come in contact with. Okay. It's interesting that if you read carefully when it talks about spiritual gifts, which is one of the aspects, of course, of, of witnessing and evangelism, it suggests that the work of the pastor 
is to equip or to help equip the rest of us to witness. Is the pastor doing that? Is your pastor doing that? Well, how would he do that? All right, when you witness, isn't it something that you have witnessed? Well, it should be the pastor ought to do, be doing that by talking about ways in which we can do that, talking about stories of people who've, who, who have done it successfully, the kind of thing that would inspire somebody else to try. Well, the, okay. But, but we've talked about, we've talked about um, being a representative. Mm -hmm. We've talked about um, talking. Mm -hmm. We've talked about, you know, several things. It all sounds like witnessing to me, everything mm -hmm. that we've talked about so far. Is that well, basically what we're getting at? Yeah. If, if you had, uh, well, put it this way, what would you need to have in your hand or, or available to you to, to make you a witness, to get you to speak up? I mean, there's everything available from little cards that you can hand out to people that says, check this website, you know, here's a Bible verse, whatever. That's some very simple, but might be effective in some cases, to pamphlets you can pass out, pass out books, Bible studies, a complete series of Bible studies. I have a question. Witnessing, is that doing good, like tutoring, feeding the poor, uh, doing other things, without telling them about Jesus or your faith? Would that be considered witnessing? Or does witnessing mean doing good and telling them about your motivations for doing good about God and Jesus. So is witnessing just doing good, or is witnessing doing good, which includes telling the person why, or telling the person part of the gospel? It seems like sometimes witnessing is defined as just doing good, and not telling. Well, and I'm, I'm we... thinking, New Age people do good. Everybody can do good. But a Christian does good because of a, uh, the gospel behind the doing good. Mm -hmm. So what good does it do to do good without including the gospel? Yeah. So I'm wondering, is that witnessing where you just do good, is that considered witnessing or? Well, look at the example of Jesus. Mm -hmm. He would do a miracle mm -hmm. and then he would make a spiritual point. Okay. Look at the example of Paul. Mm -hmm. You know, he would, he would pay his own way, he would go, he would go to the synagogues, he would talk to people, and when their opportunity came, he would talk about Christianity. He said, I'm a slave, I can't keep quiet so about doing, what I believe. So doing good without including the gospel is really not witnessing them. Not enough. In the Bible, there's another example that's an excellent example. There was the deacon Stephen. And he went to the, the synagogue that was used by the freedmen. This would be, this would be Greek-speaking Jews. Uh, and he was so convincing in his, con in his teaching about Jesus that, you know, the Jews said, we've got to stop this guy somehow. And they brought him to Sanhedrin, and he gave that marvelous sermon that's recorded in Acts 7. And at the end of that, at the very end of that, of course, you know, he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice. They were, they were stoning him to death. Lord, do not remember the sin against them. He said this and died. And I want to look at the next few verses because they're very significant. And Saul approved of his murder. This is the Saul who later was Paul. That very day, the church in Jerusalem began to suffer cruel persecution. All the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the provinces of Judea and Samaria. Some devout men buried Stephen, mourning for him with loud cries. But Saul tried to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged out the believers, both men and women, and threw them into jail. But that's not the end of the story. The believers who were scattered went everywhere. And what, what did they do when they went everywhere? They were the preaching. They were preaching the message. Philip and talk, starts talking about Philip's story. So would that, would that be true of us? When we go here and there and everywhere, do we carry the gospel with us?
Not without the fire in our belly. No. Um, do we need some persecution? We shouldn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, is it, what would it take to get us moving? Well, if you don't have the Holy Spirit prompting you on, will persecution help you be a better witness? Well, if you, if you knew there was just a short time left until Jesus was come again, would you spend more time witnessing? Mm -hmm. Would you want more people to know? Well, Jesus himself said he did not come to be served, but to serve. Matthew 20, 28, Luke 22, 27, for example. He also stated clearly that his followers were to be servants. Matthew 23, 11 and 20, 26 and 27. In what ways are we, we to be servants? Would that include personal witnessing? How Ministry? Fit with John 15, 15, I don't call you servants, but friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or does it? I, I, th I think it does. I, I think that there's some very interesting correlations. And the question is, what, in what way now? We're talking about ministry to others. This is self-imposed slavery yeah. out of gratitude. Mm -hmm. not, not servant by command, but servant from love. Mm. Interesting. Why, why does it seem that there's so little individual witnessing and evangelism among Adventists in North America today? Are we embarrassed about Jesus? Are we embarrassed about our church? There is a certain percentage of Adventists that are going gangbusters. So that cannot be said of all Adventists, but it's, it's maybe why is there such a large percentage of, of lazy, non-thinking um, non, uh, of other people type Adventists. Could it, could it be that we don't know how to do it? It's possible. I mean, maybe that's the why old, the pastor should be doing. The old tents don't work anymore. No, the old, that's true. Getting the singing group out there and and putting people on the billboards and telling them to come to this church that we're going to have an evangelism doesn't work anymore. There's the, got to be a new way to do it. The tents don't work. The new tents are the TV screen. Mm -hmm. And I have friends that are running into Adventist programming, and that are saying, hey, there's something different here. And then they go to the internet to research and, and view other programs. And so I think the tents have become the TV and the internet. And the Adv Adventists are going gangbusters. On well, there's your answer then to your question. Mm -hmm. She says there's no problem. I see. There's lots of evangelistic stuff if happening. You, Among a certain percent, <laughs> they're going gangbusters. They really are. If, you, if we took a survey among, let's say, in the major cities of America. What do you think people would say about the Adventist church? Who? They wouldn't know who it is. What? What are you about? Is that Mormon? Yeah. Yes, that's what they say. Or Jehovah's Witness? Uh -huh. You know, we went over to, just over to Colton, next door to Loma Linda, mm -hmm. and talked to the city people there, told them about, it, about Adventists. They didn't know who they were. They've yeah. heard of them, but they didn't know who they were. Yeah. And here, Loma Linda is next to them. So it's kind well, of, kind of, there's something wrong here. Yeah. Maybe the most important question of all is this, which we usually don't even think about. What do they think about God? Who, what do you mean? Who's, the people, who's they? The people around us that we associate with, we ask, well, what do they think of you? What do they think of your class? Maybe your Sabbath school class? What do they think of your church? But most important, what do they think of your God? Well, they know about God. I, yeah. I'd like to, I, I, have to run, I would, well, first of all, they know what you're talking about mm -hmm. because you go there and you talk about God. They, I've never run into anybody and say, what's a God? Yeah. They, they seem to know what a God is. So you That's can my start point. at that point. That's my point exactly. I want to know what do they think about our God? Because our God is not the same as the one that they know. Well, you know, when you say the word God, it could be almost like you're saying the word water. Somebody will think of a waterfall, someone will think of an ocean, someone will think mm -hmm. of a lake, and you're just saying the word water. When you say God, people will think of all sorts of things, and they'll say, oh, yes, I know God, and they're not thinking of the same God that another person or another person is thinking of. So My point exactly. Well, how do we solve that problem? 
Are we ready to serve? Are we ready to answer those kinds of questions? Are we just sitting back and hope, hoping somebody else will do it for us? Well, first of all, we live in a secular culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not appropriate to talk about religion in our culture. Now, there are ways to break through that, mm -hmm. but once you do, well, then that's once you pry in, then you start. But there is this little shell that you have to get through first. One day Jesus was uh, traveling from Judea to Galilee, mm -hmm. and he took the shortcut, which made his disciples very uncomfortable, I'm sure. They traveled through Samaria, and they stopped there by Jacob's well, and Jesus spoke to that woman who had had five husbands. I'm sure she was not the most popular woman in town. And she only talked to Jesus for a relatively few minutes, and she was on fire. She was back in town, and she told everybody who would listen to her. And what happened? Jesus spent three or four days in that town, and basically the whole town apparently was converted, at least many of them. And they, by, by the end of two or three days, they said, we don't believe anymore just because of what you told us. We believe because of the personal witness of Jesus Christ. Well, you know, it wasn't completely talk either. No. Because Jesus seemed to know her. Yeah. That was a little weird. <laughs> I mean, that was yeah. something that happened to her personally. She knew yeah. who her husbands were or what the husbands she didn't have. Come see the one that told me about my husband. Yeah, but and that's the point. What, what she's talking about is a personal witness. This right. is what happened to me. Yeah, that, what do you think would happen to you? That brings the point that you can't take somebody else's witness and regurgitate somebody else's. Well, you, you might kind use of that as an own. example, but... The, the advantage of giving a personal witness is it's very hard for anybody to, count, to, to, to argue with it because it's your story. So maybe um, we need to have a situation where we can actually derive a personal witness. Mm -hmm. If somebody is just looking to what other people are saying, maybe they ought to get on their knees and say, Lord, I need some personal, personal experiences here. Please send the persecution? No, not necessarily. <laughs> a lot of other things could happen. Yeah. But if something happened personally in their life, yeah. well, then it's a lot easier to go out and start talking about it. But if I'm going to talk about my, what, my, what happened to my brother, you know, or something like that, that isn't going to be a big deal. But if it happened really to me, well, you're going to be pretty loud and vocal. Mm -hmm. I have you a nephew. I'm oh. sorry. I, had a nep I have a nephew who watched 3ABN and started learning about his eating and sleeping and drinking water and exercising. And he got rid of the mood swings and, and felt better and, and is just probably one of the strictest Adventist type livers, except he does eat some meat. And he goes to his Sunday church and tells people about the Adventist health message. <laughs> and that, by the way, Saturday well, is the Sabbath. That is and a he's, personal thing he's, that she, he's, he's talking about. He's enthusiastic because he feels so good now, mm -hmm. and he felt so bad before, and he just can't hold it in. You made an interesting comment. You said, we live in a secular society, so it's inappropriate to witness. What kind of a society did Paul live in? Pagan Rome. Well, I what think kind of a society I was that. I think that's still a little different. Well, in what way? In that they did think about gods back then. Right here, they think about atheism, which is nothing. So, how do we go about putting in a good word for the Lord? Sometimes I think the secular society is an illusion that the powers that be and government like to say allude to, but when you talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, they are not as secular as the government would like them to be. Not true. Well, even, can, even people in the government may not be as secular as the government people would want them to be. Yes, because I taught at a public high school, and those teachers in science were not evolutionists, but the majority see, they, of them. They felt it Im important and appropriate to kind of keep back, hold back a little bit. And that's what the secular society tends to do. It's appropriate to kind of hold back and not just let it go and say, God, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, you don't want to say that. 
That's what um, Peter did. He held back a little bit. <laughs> well, I'm not saying that it's good or bad or we're doing something wrong. I'm just saying that it is what it is, and that's what it is. Let, let me ask, uh, let, let's make this more personal. We believe that someday, at the third coming of Jesus Christ, the wicked are going to be inside the city. I'm, I'm sorry, the righteous are going to be inside the city, and the wicked are going to be outside. Suppose you were standing up on the wall there, or you were looking out somewhere, and you saw someone out there and you said, I had an opportunity to witness to that person and I didn't. How would you feel? Terrible. Not good. Terrible. Well, then, then heaven's a terrible place if you got to live with that the whole time. Well, how, no, how no, not, not the whole time. How can you go that far? <laughs> not the whole time. But God himself is going to be weeping as his children perish. Don't tell me that God doesn't care about his children who are dying. Well, another thing is you have to look as the cup half empty or half full. Yeah. Maybe I didn't witness to that person, but look at there are some people here that I did was able to witness to in our terrible earth that are here. And maybe that wouldn't be so depressing, but of course you would feel terrible about the others. But you also have to look at the ones you were able to reach. I, I think we have to take serious the, the, the message that we get that says that when we don't do what we're supposed to, there will be eternal loss. Mm -hmm. And that would make heaven a least like better place to live because of that, which I don't Possibly. really think that that could happen. Well, well you can argue with it. That, that's what the prophet said. See, well, <laughs> well, it also says that everybody who is saved will have the, their names in the book that was written before the foundations of the world. So, if you look at it that way, that's, that, that's, that's pure predestination and that we don't believe no, in no, that. No, 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 I'm not going to go that way, but it does say that. It, it, means, it means that God already knows the ones you're going to witness to. Right, and he already knows yeah. the ones you're not going to witness to. Yeah. Well, 2 Peter... Mean there won't be eternal loss. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow to do what he has promised, is one of the things we need to witness about, as some think. And before this, of course, the verses up ahead said, you know, people said, everything continues just the same as it always has been. What's the big deal? Instead, he is patient with you because he does not want anyone to be destroyed. Do we really believe that? But he wants all to turn away from their sins. And what about Matthew 9, 36 to 38? And this is the Good News Bible again. As he saw the crowds, his heart was filled with pity for them. This is Jesus, of course, because they were worried and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So he said to his disciples, the harvest is large, but there are few workers to gather it in. Pray to the owner of the harvest that he will send out workers to gather in his harvest. And that, that quotation has always puzzled me. I struggle with it. I mean, isn't God doing everything he can do? What, if we pray, if you pray to the God, see, please send, I mean, what does it mean to send more workers into the harvest? Doesn't that mean, please give us more help in witnessing? If you pray for that, isn't God already doing everything he possibly could do to get as many witnesses out there as possible? Or is this a verse to suggest that if we're praying for this to happen, we might actually be doing something? Yeah, something might happen to you. Oh, dear. <laughs> And I mean, I might get out there and do some witnessing. Exactly. Well, think back to your personal experience during this past week. Were there times when you could have witnessed for your faith but didn't? What does God think of those missed opportunities? Are we embarrassed about being Christians? No, well, but other people try to embarrass us. In the more developed countries, Seventh-day Adventists tend to have two to three hours of exposure to church or church activities once a week. Is that enough time to train us to be witnesses? Is the pastor doing that in your church? Is, are we even making an attempt to do that in the little time we have? God intends for churches to be communities with all members working together as closely as the parts of the human body. Now, I will tell you, this is a time for us to talk about personal witnessing or something like that, I had the privilege one time of belonging to a small church. Small church, we started out about 50 members. 
And I came there. I was in an academic program, um, the same one I mentioned a little while ago, in a public university. But this little church had nothing to do with the university. But we joined there. And at the, about the same time we joined, another physician came there and said, I want to try an experiment if the church is accomplished will agree. I want to do health programs, stop smoking plans, other things in this small church. I work half my time doing programs in the church, and I'll do the other half of my time uh, as a physician and earn my, my living doing that. He was willing basically to donate half time to, to do this work at the church. That little church was on fire. Within nine months, the, their membership had basically doubled. And what happened? Every single church member was involved in some kind of an outreach program. That, that, church, that church was filled almost every evening with some kind of program going on, and the church members were the experts there in helping people to stop smoking. They were helping people to, to lose weight. They were helping people in cooking schools. I mean, the place was on fire. How often does that happen? Not often enough. Well, look at Ephesians 4. Uh, there's, we're going to talk more about the earlier verses. You can start with verse 11. I'm not going to read those right now. I'm going to come down to the conclusion in verse 16. Under his control, if the Holy Spirit were in charge and he was really able to do his work, under his control, all the different parts of the body, talking about the church body, of course, fit together, and the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So when each separate part works as it should, who are the separate parts? Us. The whole body grows and builds itself up through love. Now, that's what we're talking about. Okay? What happens to a human body if an important part is missing? What was the Apostle Paul trying to implied by this verse. The church will grow if all the members are active and alive. Is that true of your church? Wherever you are. But if there it says he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, mm -hmm. and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, that's the mm -hmm. church members, for the work of ministry. That's what I was talking about earlier. I said the work of the pastor, according to those verses, which we'll get into in more details later, the work of the pastor, according to that verse at least, is to prepare all of us who are members for witnessing. That's right. Yeah. Well, let's look at an example, a biblical example of what might have happened. Paul went to the church at Thessalonica. He was only able to stay there for a short time because of persecution from the Jews, etc. But look at what happened when he left. For we brought the good news to you. Now, this is Paul writing later back to the Thessalonians about what happened when he was there. For we brought the good news to you, not with words only, but also with power and the Holy Spirit and with complete conviction of its truth. You know how we lived when we were with you. It was for your own good. You imitated us and the Lord and even... Though you suffered much, you received the message with the joy that comes from the Holy Spirit. So you became an example to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia, for not only did the message about the Lord go out from you throughout Macedonia and Achaia, but the news about your faith in God has gone everywhere. There is nothing then that we need to say. So in effect, he's saying, you know, I was there for a few weeks, and these people just came alive. They, they were on fire. What did he say to them in that short period of time? Was it the words that did it, or was there a spirit there? And maybe the spirit isn't here. Well, you know, you always say that Jesus on the road to Emmaus, Emmaus Jesus explained in the Old Testament how it all prophesied to, to him, how it all fit together, and how he was the fulfillment of that. Um, and so with a story like that, the Bible becomes a living thing and you have mm -hmm. something to witness about. You also need to know the prophecies so you mm -hmm. can, you can let um, me, put them together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. let, me, uh, let me play the devil's advocate for a moment in one respect. One of the reasons these Thessalonians were on fire is because if they weren't on fire, they were out because they were under persecution. 
maybe we need more persecution. What do you mean? If they weren't on fire, they were out. Well, I, I, what I'm saying is that there were there were no Laodicean church members in the Thessalonica. So, church. if you were committed to be a Christian, you were very committed because um, it was a, at risk to yourself. Yeah. Wait, are we putting the, the horse before the cart here? You're saying that we need some persecution. How do you I, know? How do you know that it wasn't because the spirit exploded there, and then the persecution? came in because of that. Either way, it would be just fine with me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I think that's what usually happens. Well, what are the factors that keep us from witnessing today? Lack of confidence. In what Lack of confidence, not sure what to say. Lack what of confidence in not knowing what to say and not believing that God will give me the words to say it. Mm -hmm. What is the underlying uh, emotion to lack of confidence? That I will misrepresent. It's fear, isn't it? Isn't it? And uh, I'm perfect love casts out fear. I'm still trying to get a picture of, of what we should be seeing. I mean, I keep... No, I, no, he isn't saying going out in the corner, out in the no. corner of the streets and I, preaching. What, what are you saying? I mean, saying what are here, we looking I'll be very, for? I will be very honest with you. Some of us work in a, society, in a setting where most of the people we work with, maybe they're patients or, or clients or whatever, but most of the people we work with are non-Christian or at least not Adventist. So there's lots and I see hundreds of people every day who are not Seventh-day Adventists. So every time we strike up a conversation we should bring God into it every, well every as, as a physician thing, go I to, go to the no. mechanic by the way did you know that God did this that and the other thing while you're putting in my new piston I need to tell you this <laughs> and how about when you go to go to the cafeteria what do you think while Paul a guy is done? serving you and say did you know that God created that and just keep going and going and going what what do you is that think? what my, you want to see my question is what do you think Jesus would have done what would Paul have done? I think you can just say, God bless you. Well, that's... Thank you, miraculous. thank you, and God bless you. No, no. Well, the Holy Spirit is the one member of the Godhead who seems to be most involved, if we, if we read the scriptures, in assisting us in witnessing and evangelism. There's some interesting verses about that. Look at Acts 2.47. And you remember, this was after Peter's sermon there. They were praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And every day the Lord added to their group those who were being saved. Uh, I want to comment on <laughs> Gary's work over there. I think he got the cart absolutely before the horse. What, You're saying, what should I do? What should I be looking for? What should I see? I'm, what I think is, if well, the relate, the if question. the re, if he's the relation, the question, what, if, why should should we be? Witnessing more, and that's what I'm saying. Well, how do you can you tell if we're witnessing enough or or witnessing too much? I mean, we're you're making work out of it. And what I'm, I'm trying to what I'm trying to say is that if we have that relationship, that vital connection with Jesus, that is as real as your best hobby. That comes, what you do comes naturally. It's not a thing that, you're, that your pastor is going to make a list on the wall and you're going to run out and do. But even if I did have a hobby like that, that my religion was my hobby, Ken would still ask that same question. I'd wonder if I'm doing enough. Mm -hmm. It's my, like Ellen White saying we're not drinking enough water, so we drink more water. And then you read it again, we're not drinking enough water, so we're drinking more water. That's what I'm Check getting whether at. you're dehydrated, and then drink that amount of <laughs> that you need. I mean, well, Paul, in his, in his discussion of these issues, says one of the problems is that we tend to want results right now. And he says we need to recognize that some people are sowers, they sow the seed. Others are waterers, they come along and put on the fertilizer and the water, etc., and other people then show up and they are the harvesters, they're the reapers. 
this Peter's sermon, remember at, at the end of Peter's sermon, they, there were 3,000 people joined the church. I mean, and that was just a, in, in one, small, one small area in one part of the world. And you know, it all works together. I think some of the m best witnessing comes from these technical people like yourself that keep this technical stuff working and so that us talking heads or whatever can be on a show. So witnessing is, is also dedicating a life to keeping the witness avenues open. Even like before Jesus, what did they clear the road? Well, those road clearers weren't talking about Jesus, but they were clearing the road. So I think witnessing takes many forms, and it doesn't necessarily have to be talking to a person. But I don't want to be feel guilty because I went to a vendor to buy a TV camera to do that witnessing and then wonder if I've talked to him enough about God, you know, or else I'm going to be up on the wall worrying Here, about whether or not I talked enough to about it. Here's, your, here's the problem, Gary. I'm afraid that most Seventh-day Adventists can go to a hundred vendors without even thinking of the possibility of witnessing. That's right. That's where the problem is. I just think of God bless you, um, you know, that uh, the Lord gave me these abilities and I'd like um, to look at this camera or something. I, I just think just little, little drops in conversation. Well, I, I suppose the best thing I could do is go to that vendor and say what I want it for. Yes. I mean, I'm going to have, this camera sure. is going to go to LLBN. It's a Christian station. Absolutely. And uh, we broadcast all over the world and tell them what we broadcast as much as we can. Yes. And that's, yes. that's about all and I can then, do for that sure. time. And then you wait for the Holy Spirit inside him to ask you a question. And if he doesn't and ask, a, ask him. And if he doesn't ask a question, you have, you have witnessed. How did you see? And, and you may see him three months later, and then he'll ask you something, some question that you think is off the wall, and the Holy Spirit would have been moving him along that time. It, it sounds like the problem basically is make sure you're not ashamed of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, make sure that you're yeah, putting out as that. much as he, you know, that's, that's appropriate for, for the time, and maybe not overdo it because because with the Lord willing that there'll be somebody else down the road that will yeah. that will latch on to what you did before. I mean, didn't we think about that with Jesus? Mm -hmm. Didn't Jesus do a lot of witnessing before and then after he died, Peter? Yeah. When he did his when, his um, uh, mass baptisms, it was because of what Jesus had done before. Exactly. Jesus had done the sowing, he'd done the watering, and now the disciples are doing the reaping. Yeah. It's just too bad that some of these preachers won't get credit for some of the baptisms because <laughs> um, the, it seems like the guy that actually does the baptism gets all the credit, and gets mm -hmm. the numbers put and on when, when, somebody, when somebody else might have done the groundwork before and he's the one that started the whole thing well, to give him the success in the first no, place. In God's book, it'll say one-fourth of it goes to this person, one-fourth goes to this person, one-fourth goes to that person, everybody will get the credit. Yeah. Well, I, my point is that counting the numbers isn't going to... <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> well, one of the issues that we sometimes forget is that God is just waiting for an opportunity to work with us. Do we believe that He's capable of doing a good job? Hmm. He's just waiting for us to open our mouth, hopefully intelligently, and witness about him. And he will take over. He will, he will help out. Um, think about Paul and Barnabas. Why did they report back to the church at Antioch and later to the church at Jerusalem? Is reporting an important part of the, of the, of the message? What do you mean reporting? You mean they well, I mean... We think we, witnessing is I go out on the street or I go wherever I start some meetings or I talk to people about Jesus. Is coming back and telling the church what I did, is that part of my witnessing? Absolutely, and inspires the other people. Exactly. It's important because, one, it reinforces what I'm doing, and two, it gives other people ideas about how maybe they could do something. Absolutely appropriate. Yeah. Um, Have you considered what aspects of witnessing and evangelism you might become involved with in your church? Could you make a list 
of outreach activities that you would be willing to do? Which of those activities do you feel most capable of doing? Remember that witnessing takes time and effort. No doubt many of us feel that our lives and our days are already too full with cares and responsibilities. So what do you do about that? Well, what is most important? Which do we consider most important in the overall scheme of things? The necessity of providing for ourselves and our families plus all the things that go along with that? Or the work of finishing the gospel? When it's all done and said, which is the most important? Can we change or to and? You have to do both. Yeah. Would you dare to actually volunteer to assist in some evangelistic outreach activities in your church? Could you suggest some new ideas that have not been tried yet in your church? Notice these words from Ellen White. The work of God in this earth can never be finished until the men and women comprising our church membership rally to the work and unite their efforts with those of ministers and church officers. Ellen White, Gospel Workers, page 352. That's pretty blunt, isn't it? Well, what about working with others? Could you find another person, or maybe several other people, to work together with you to make it easier to witness? I know that I've had times in the past when I've had someone else I, I shared with, and they would come and say, well, you know what happened to me today? And they would say, well, you know what happened to me today? And that kind of thing just really, really inspires activity, and you find all kinds of ways in which to witness. The early church became a kind of a communal church. Everybody was, in fact, they shared their means, they shared food, everything. You think that might ever happen again in the Christian church? Should it? Well, what about that? When there's a severe depression, I think the church people will come together like that again. Sometime, and we're running out of time here, someday, hopefully soon, the final events of this history, Earth's history will take place. Persecution, maybe even torture, ridicule, perhaps imprisonment will be used by Satan to try to prevent us from witnessing. If we're not witnessing now with nothing basically to prevent us, would we dare to witness then? There are a lot of other things we could say, but... The example of the apostles, they were out there at risk of their lives, and most of them gave up their lives to witness. What are we doing? Do we need a little more inspiration? Do we need the Holy Spirit behind us? He's ready, are we? See you next week.